Hello and welcome to The Appetite, a podcast brought to you by Opal Food and Body Wisdom, an eating disorder center in Seattle, Washington. I'm your host, Carter Umhow, a therapist, artist, and writer. And today I'm talking with co-founder and nutrition director at Opal, Julie Church, about sugar. This is a topic that we've talked about a little bit. We've talked about it in terms of how to feed your kids and how to relate to sugar yourself. And we just haven't gotten into it enough, I don't think, because there is so much out there that really seems to hyper focus on the significance of sugar in our diets and uh, the harm of sugar in our diets. So we want to talk about it. Hi, Julie. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I do think it's a relevant conversation. And I do think that we haven't dug deeper into what is sugar and what is it used for and what if you don't eat it and all that stuff. So I think it's a relevant conversation. I think it's very relevant because people have a lot of questions about it. But I think we need to get back to basics first. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know, what is sugar? (laughs) (laughs) So sugar is actually just the generic name for sweet tasting soluble carbohydrates. So carbohydrates is one of the main macronutrients that our body lives off of, right? Protein, fats, and carbohydrates. Sugar is maybe more the the common word or term that's used and thrown around more often. And when we think about the four types of carbohydrates, the two carbohydrates that are most commonly referred to as sugar, monosaccharides and disaccharides. So within the family of carbohydrates, those are the two that are probably going to be most referred to as sugar because they are simpler, They're the more simple carbohydrates. And they're glucose, fructose, and galactose. Okay. Okay. And then the disaccharides are the ones that then you combine a couple of those to make something else. So something like lactose, which is galactose and glucose. Oh. Or sucrose, you might hear of also. And that's glucose and fructose. Okay. (laughs) So... All that to say, sugar is just easier to say than some of these long words. <laughs> yeah, they really are. <laughs> and to know what category it's in and all of that. So the sugar is more commonly also used when we think about simple sugars or maybe the conversation around simple sugars versus complex carbohydrates. Would you say that you hear people talking about complex carbohydrates and then simple sugars? Is that common vernacular I out think, there, Carter? I think so. <laughs> I think I faintly remember hearing some maybe more complicated things when people were really obsessed with, like, the Atkins diet or no-carb diets, different diets I've heard of. Mm -hmm. I feel a little bit clueless right now in terms of the specifics because I haven't been on those diets. But Mm -hmm. thinking about sugar, I I always thought of it as sweets. Oh, okay. And and then I started learning through word of mouth about different things that people shouldn't be eating – according to different diets, that actually carbs are sugars and yeah. fruits are bad and all these things. So true. So yes. is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I think you're <laughs> I think you're right in saying that maybe somebody says sugars and they think, oh, okay, so I shouldn't eat candy or that's the concern is around candy and desserts and sugary cereals or something. Mm-hmm. But yes, then the conversation has gotten deeper and some of the diets out there have gone further to then pick out – particular foods that are naturally higher in sugars and some of these sugars that I've named. So things like fructose or galactose. So some of these foods that are out there that then are higher in those and then having a philosophy around a particular diet or a particular imperative to lessen those or avoid them entirely. Okay. So you've listed some words that I have seen on food labels. Okay. And I think I feel curious as we continue to define Mm -hmm. sugar, what are those foods? Like is fructose a food? Okay. (laughs) Like is it an ingredient? Is it a compound? Is it a – Right. What is it? Is it a chemical? I don't know. (laughs) It sounds pretty basic, but I I don't understand. Right. Right. So that's the actual chemical structure. So carbohydrate is a carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. And when we think about all these different ones, it's just different amounts of them. So a different number of those molecules then connected in different ways. Okay. So fructose is a good example of one maybe. Fructose, so you might, it's an easy one to remember, I think, because it's mostly found in fruit Mm -hmm. and honey. And then things like galactose is another different 
mix of these molecules put together and that you're going to find more in dairy or legumes, butter. And some of them have a bad rap and others don't as much. Like I would never have thought of butter as a food that has sugar in it. Okay. Ever. Would have, <laughs> never would have crossed my mind. Yes. D- the dairy <laughs> category, right? So I know butter sometimes isn't put in that category, but yes. There you go. Okay. Okay. So there's sugar in a lot of different things. Correct. Okay. So how do we think about sugar as part of a normal diet? Yeah. Why do we need sugar? Okay. Do we need sugar? Yes. So sugar, if we're back to thinking about it as carbohydrate, it's one of the main macronutrients that our body lives off of. And so if one eliminates carbohydrates or eats very, very small amounts of it, then proteins and fats are then broken down to then make glucose and give our body the actual carbohydrates that we need. So it's not something that we can live without. It's just how are we going to source it? With the Atkins, it's very clearly seen right away that, okay, sure, our body can do that, but it is putting your body under stress and it is taxing your, especially liver and kidneys, to be able to process those proteins and fats to then make the carbohydrates that our body needs. So it's inefficient (laughs) to do it that way. It can even break down those organs to then be failing, to the point of failing. I'm hearing that and feel surprised because a lot of the common conversation around sugar is that it's damaging your body and your organs and you shouldn't have it. And so to hear that not having it could damage your organs is a little bit (laughs) mind-blowing. Yes. From the non-diet conversation, that's been 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 trying to be heard for a while, that these extreme eliminations of particular whole food groups are are not healthy for the body. Because there's no balance that can be found by eliminating something entirely. Right, right. A good example, I think, beyond even just the organ failure that possibly could happen from overtaxing the body to create Jeez, what it might yeah. need, I think even just recognizing well, what happens? So if the body is restricted from or doesn't have enough of the carbohydrates, what happens? You know, our perspective is the body is is wise. There's something there to listen to. And if we look at natural mechanisms within the body to A, create it, right? So they take what we might get and make it to live off of it is one thing. Maybe this is a side note that I didn't say, but the brain singularly lives off of glucose. So carbohydrates. So your brain is the hub of everything happening in our body. And so if we don't have it, our brain doesn't function. But maybe beside the point, but it's, we want our brain. That sounds incredibly (laughs) important. I know. We want the brain to work. (laughs) So if someone is restricting sugar or carbohydrates, then you're going to have an impact on your brain. What kind of impact would that be? Well, that's where in the small ways we can think about brain fog and inability to stay focused and all of those things. Maybe so, depression, anxiety. Right. You know, to, to say, what is the purpose? Like, why then eat it? I'm saying, well, these extreme things could happen if you don't eat it. But recognize that, yes, serotonin, which is something that helps regulate our mood, carbohydrates are a precursor to that. Our, our body actually needs to have the carbohydrates to then create that chemical for our brain to be happy. So that is a pretty commonly seen thing is that when somebody goes on a low-carb diet that a uh, significant side effect can be depression and mood instability. So if carbohydrates are used, for example, for mood regulation in that way at the biochemical, you know, molecular level, what else is happening there that maybe could teach us if our body needs these carbohydrates or these sugars or not? Another lesson that we can take is learning from something called neuropeptide Y. What is that? So it's a neuromodulator that drives feeding and eating. And Neuropeptide Y increases carbohydrate cravings. So when we don't have enough of the carbohydrates in our bloodstream and in our body, then the brain releases this neuromodulator, and then it leads people to eat and eat specifically at carbohydrates and get what we're missing. Another important purpose of having carbohydrates in our food intake and in our body is that carbohydrates are also needed as a precursor to creating white blood cells. And white blood cells, obviously what help us stay well and uh, fight off disease and sickness. And so that is also another example, I guess, similar to like serotonin or something that the body is needing carbohydrates to be able to create this thing. It's another example of that. So 
I take that as, I think we're supposed to eat it. I think so. I also take that as a really wonderful explanation for the, again, common conversation around carbs, around sugar, that it's addictive. And so to think about someone craving it with intensity or being particularly drawn to it, I would maybe imagine that there might be that, so will you say it again, neuropeptide Y? You got it. I did? Okay. So there might be some sort of deficiency there. Right. If there is a craving, likely then there's probably neuropeptide Y being released by the brain to tell you to go and get food and specifically to get some carbohydrates. And then when somebody eats it, the neuropeptide Y decreases and the craving goes away, which is, I know, what we experience as a human when that happens. But when we look at the actual biochemical level, that is what's happening. Our body is going to try to push us to get the needed nutrient. Is there science that disagrees with the sort of toxicity of sugar? I right. mean, that's such a – like yeah. sugar's toxic. Sugar's killing us all. Sugar's mm-hmm. and everything. Is it actually a problem? Yeah. So I think there still is stuff that we have to learn, and I'm open to having that mindset. I do believe that the food supply has changed. If we look 100 years ago, and we know that – a lot of the sweeteners that are used, if we look at getting, yes, sugar cane as kind of a traditional table sugar, we've got high fructose corn syrup, which is another one of those combination disaccharides, right? So it's got the glucose and fructose in that. So we have all these variety of ways now that sweetness has been brought into the food supply and into our eating. And so, sure, there's things to learn about how that might impact us in the long run. And I can't get onto the conversation that sugar is to blame, I guess, for myriad of health concerns, issues, states of being. (laughs) And especially what I can't get on board with is the solution is to moderate, decrease, count your grams of sugar, like make sure you're not eating X amount based on your demographic. Why can't you get on board with that? (laughs) I can't get on board with it because I recognize all of what's changed over alongside the changing of our sugar intake and the sugar supply. Many times you're going to see, well, there's a, a rise in the incidences of diabetes, and that must be that people are eating more sugar and that is causing diabetes. And nutrition research is very difficult, if not impossible, to then get to very, very pinpoint and and have an actual causal relationship. So much and most of nutrition research is correlative. So in the correlative conversation, I have to say, look at all of the other things that have changed in the last hundred years, let's say. And so the environment and the social patterns of people and Food, sure. What else am I missing that's changed? Everything. I don't know. Yeah, everything. (laughs) Yeah. So I just can't see the fixing is to decrease sugar to then have us have a quote-unquote healthier population. I believe you. I believe you in that. (laughs) I have also heard so many challenging questions around this. And we'll play devil's advocate maybe. Please do. Okay. I think one thing that I'm curious about is, okay, sure, it's not the whole thing to blame. Okay, I hear you. You know, we can't assume that every single problem that we have is based off of sugar. But if that much has changed and there's that much more sugar in so much of the processed foods out there, shouldn't we be more careful or is it actually okay to have a lot? Mm -hmm. Does it matter? What does it do to our bodies to have that much? I know you've sort of said we don't know, Mm -hmm. but – So interestingly enough, some people would say that having too much sugar also can damage your organs, right? Right. So liver and kidney pancreas. So – and overtax the systems that are in place there. So I think that that's an interesting – I just said not having enough could because your body's doing all these other things to make it. And then the other extreme of thinking that, oh, well, if you have too much of it, could that also damage your organs? And so – 
I think the main piece that I hear in a lot of that is a lot of fear and a solution to the problem being to eliminate or to decrease intake. And my approach, our approach is just to take the bigger step back and go, in my present world, there is this present day food supply and I'm going to know some of what I'm eating and what I'm taking in and, and some of it I'm not going to, to know what it is slash what the impact might be on me. And so I just believe that then we have to work on our own relationship with those foods and recognize, okay, what is the patterns that I see in myself? What do I enjoy? What ends up feeling less pleasurable or less comfortable for me when I'm having a pattern of eating with high sugar foods? And that's where I think the solution lies. So am I saying that somebody that is exposed to and has a wide variety of foods that they are going to always be drawn to the high sugary foods, which is what more of the addiction model and addiction literature would say? No, I don't believe that. I see actually the other thing play out at Opal where we allow for people to have free access to food and a wide variety of foods. And so I know in practice that that's not the case. But that is also a population, right, in the, in the setting of Opal is that we are teaching the mindfulness and connectedness. We're helping people become more embodied and pay attention to their styles of eating and their patterns around food. And in and of itself, I see the resolution, which is balance of it. And I don't believe that that landing place where people find themselves is going to be damaging to their internal organs or have it be, quote unquote, the cause of their death is eating sugar. Yeah. <laughs> but, but most people end up eating sugar. Right. Most Even if they do. start treatment with us eliminating it <laughs> or having excessive, excessive, excessive amounts of it coming in, mm, everybody ends up eating some of it <laughs> mm-hmm. and finding a way to engage with it that's somewhere in that balanced place. So given the fact that we shouldn't be too preoccupied with the impact of sugar on our bodies, that actually our bodies know what to do with it, what is our body doing with it? (laughs) How are we using the sugar? Depending on what source you end up eating of food that contains carbohydrates in it, our body breaks it all down to glucose. And glucose is an important energy source that's needed for all the cells and organs of our bodies, like brain, I mentioned, I guess, the muscles. So glucose gets into the blood, and then the pancreas, an organ, releases insulin, whose primary job is to get glucose from the blood into the cells. So the glucose we eat gets into the bloodstream, and then this insulin finds it and then kind of cranks out the usable source of that and that usable energy into the cells for all of its many functioning. And then... When those cells get what they need, there can be some glucose left over that's in the bloodstream, and that gets stored in the form of glycogen and mostly finds a muscle and connects there, water molecule also, and it can be stored there. And then when our body maybe doesn't have that snack right there to get the glucose, it can then take a storage form of that glucose to feed our brain and or, you know, your doing some sort of exercise that's pushing your muscles a little bit more than it's also grabbing that energy source from the muscles. But then it can be depleted pretty quickly too. So we usually have about half an hour or so of quick energy in our muscles stored. But after that half an hour run or whatever it might be, then the body doesn't have those stored form of glycogen there for the needed purposes of glucose in the body. So I always like to make sure people, when they hear stored nutrients, people have a lot of fear around that. They think, what does that mean? Is that going to change my body size or my shape? And the reality is that, yes, there's glycogen, like I mentioned, there's some water that gets attached to it. And there is some weight gain. If one was to step on a scale and look at that, there is usually some weight gain. But that also links to when people start to lose weight early in a diet. That's that water weight that you might hear about is because they've lost that water that has been connected to that storage form of glucose in your body. So there's so many things that our body does with it. But I think just recognizing that it does through our bloodstream get to so many of our organs and cells and keeps us ticking. So it sounds like sugar is really, really helpful 
Yeah. Is there such a thing as too much sugar? So I believe that that's each person to find out for themselves. Okay. And that is related to, okay, if you don't have any of it and then you end up having these obsessive thoughts and compulsions around it, that's too little. (laughs) If you're becoming obsessed with it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That neuropeptide Y was released and you're having this focus on getting it. Well, then you're probably not taking in enough. But then if you're also maybe in a pattern of finding, wow, like all I'm repetitively doing is going for soda and candy for my snacks and my meals, okay, that probably is also what else is missing? How are you going to end up feeling in that? And likely you're also going to have some experience of sugar crashes. What is that actually? (laughs) We haven't talked about that. I know. I'm jumping in, but I know we can come back to that too if you want. Yeah, I can. But I think you would have some experience of, whoa, like I'm I, this is this is off. I'm not functioning fully. I'm feeling maybe some quick energy and then some crashes of feeling really low energy and I would guess that if somebody is attuned and ca- connected to even for a moment that they, they're craving something else, like maybe something warm or savory or something that would have some other colors or textures and that in and of itself would lead somebody away from only living off of soda and candy. And that's where I believe that we have to have the skills and that being taught to us as kids and teens and adults to say, oh, I'm going to notice the experience that I have with only living off of candy and soda or totally eliminating these things and listening to our body to then find some sort of balance. In a way, I feel like we've talked a lot about sugar from the perspective of people that maybe are restricting it more or combating okay. the perspective okay. of someone that's restricting more. Yeah. For the person that's not and is really comfortable reaching for mm. sugar, candy, cookies, soda, whatever, how would they be experiencing they? some of those cues in their body that it might be too much or mm-hmm. that they are crashing? So if somebody does find themselves in a pattern of maybe only turning to sugary foods or maybe just being somebody that would have that pretty commonly throughout their day, I do think that there is a natural regulation to want a variety of foods and that then also is a variety of food experiences of different flavors and textures. And with that, then one is going to be drawn to things that may not have added sugar or may be lower in carbohydrates naturally in the food supply. So I hear it very commonly from clients who are in the depths of really, you know, more extreme swings with their pattern of eating and high distress around the way they're engaging with food. But I also hear it from the person next to me that has what I would call more normal relationship with food, that sort of natural drawing from, okay, an experience of, man, I just want a big steak. I just want something that's juicy and firm and just will stick with me in that way. A lot of times that comes out of, uh, oh, like I have. I've only been eating, maybe it is the more processed foods that might be more crunchy, salty, sweet, simple in that way. And they want something that's going to have that different. And it is different nutritionally. What the body is getting at the biochemical level is nutritionally. But I do hear of people that really struggle with eating disorders and people that don't, that there is this natural connection to go and have different types of foods. So what are the actual, I think you're asking like, well, what's the experience of it? Like, what does somebody feel? And everybody does have different feelings. Of course, of course. I think a helpful visual that we'll link in the show notes is this graph. And on the x-axis, we have blood sugar. And on the y-axis, we have hours. And on this graph, it shows what happens, how quickly in time does your blood sugar change in your body in a time frame when you're eating things. And this graph just shows that carbohydrates, when eaten in isolation, which remember that that very rarely happens, but if, if eaten in isolation, right, if you only are eating soda and candy, you are going to have this peak of a blood sugar rise in your bloodstream, and then you're going to have a more quick dip. So that's when somebody talks about a blood sugar crash. And how quick is quick? So that's going to be within the half an hour to an hour. Okay. Yeah, maybe sometimes two hours that somebody then would experience that. 
And then if somebody eats protein, that's processed in the body longer, maybe takes up to five hours to get it through the bloodstream and the metabolic process. And then fat takes longer, and it takes even up to 10 hours. So the reality is that most of the time we're eating carbohydrates, proteins, and fats together. And in the mix, then if you look at this graph, it would be sort of a moderate place. You're not going to have a big spike and crash if you eat carbohydrates in the midst of a meal that you also are having proteins and fats. With the mix of those carbohydrates, then our body gets this nice balanced experience of metabolism and we don't feel the rises and the falls as much. And so if somebody is wanting to understand what cues to feel within their body, I think this can be a helpful visual to then go, okay, wait, maybe I am experiencing more of a spike and a dip that might be because most of what I just ate for that meal was carbohydrate rich. Uh, oh, maybe if I combine that and maybe make have a sandwich versus only bread, I wouldn't have that feeling as much. So it isn't a dangerous thing or a bad thing. It's just maybe uh, something to learn about the way that your body feels when it's metabolizing these different nutrients. So you might hear hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia, and that's the low blood sugar and high blood sugar. And we go through various states of that. The normal fluctuations of these things are things that lead us to notice our appetite cues and even hunger in the moments of going, oh, I need food. Some of that's coming from the lack of blood sugar in our bloodstream, right? Lack of sugar in our bloodstream. And it directs us to then choose to go get food. I very much trust that attuned eating will be the answer to most problems. But when it comes down to it, is there any property in sugar that actually makes it addictive? There's a lot of debate out there about this, yeah, for sure. I've heard a lot about it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there are researchers that would say and show brain images about how sugar activates the same brain regions that are activated when a person consumes drugs like cocaine. And that has kind of snowballed into this strong belief about sugar addiction. And the reality is that that is true that that happens in the brain. I can't deny those images and uh, the activation of that. But one of the main things that makes sugar addiction different than a drug addiction is tolerance. So tolerance is defined as a person's diminished response to a drug. That is the result of repeated use. This happens in, in somebody who is addicted to a drug. There's increased tolerance, right? They need more and more of it. And what we find is that with sugar, if people have sugar in their diet, they're eating sugar and carbohydrates, there will be a stopping point. They don't just need more and more to get the activation. And one of the concerning things about the research around this is that the populations that are being used for these studies are chronic dieters. They're most of the time people that have been restrictive in the way that they've eaten. And then they're being studied to say, is their behavior addictive? Are their brain and bodies reacting to access to sugar in a way that mimics addiction? And all I do is I look at those studies and I go, of course, because they're we, dieters. Yeah. Right. So, of course, we are going to look and see that they react to sugar, want sugar. Like I talked about with neuropeptide Y. Yes, there are natural mechanisms that lead us to get carbohydrates in our body because we need them as an essential nutrient to live off of. This is a kind of a mind-blowing plot twist. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of the sugar addiction research out there, all it proves to me is that we need carbohydrates and that if you don't eat them, you will crave them and act with addictive behaviors towards sugar. So we will put a link on here from a review article that was put out in 2016 called Sugar Addiction, the State of the Science. And that was the results. My mind is also going to my conversation with Anita Johnston way back when on the podcast in thinking about um, metaphor in food and how we engage different foods based off of some of our emotional needs. And sugar is one that People are constantly associating with emotional need and, and carbs, I think, more generally. Yeah. That, oh, you know, I was so sad. So I ate three pints of ice cream or, oh, I was so sad. And so all I've been eating is pizza or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Or maybe even celebratory. I'm so yeah. excited. And yes. so yeah. I ate so much chocolate cake when I was at the party yeah. or, what you know, whatever yeah. it is. And so I can imagine that there might be some attunement that needs to be built both around your physical experience and how that's connected to your emotional experience. So 
are you having a rough day regularly because you're having to work so hard or you're strained? Do you want just quick, easy, fast, sweet, comforting stuff because that part of your life is out of balance? Are you desiring the sort of quick hit of energy because you don't sleep really because you're so worried or Mm -hmm. you're uncomfortable in your bed? You know, what are the different components of your life that are bringing you toward uh, sort of a compulsion, quote unquote, toward one food or the other? And how much of that is your diet and lack of balance and lack of attunement? How much of that is something actually being really off kilter in your life? Yeah. Sort of the seesaw going the other way. Right. Right. Yes. And I I think you naming some of those examples helps me also to just an important message of saying food works. In a lot of these moments, there are neurochemicals made that then send a message to our brain that like, oh, the dopamine and the serotonin that's like positive when we start to eat in those moments where maybe we are sad. And so it does instantly work. And so that is why people will be drawn back to some of the patterns. And I don't believe that we have to be afraid of that. Right. And instead, it's learning and understanding what those patterns are for each of us and in your own individual relationship with food so that then you can know what's going on when, oh, wow, I just got to the end of my day and I only chose this one type of food in this one category and it was, you know, this kind of thing. And wow, yeah, if I think about it, that's really only giving me this kind of nutrient, you know, whoo, what do I feel like right now? I just, but that is each person's individual. Right. And a different story for everybody to investigate on their own around maybe what emotional patterns are happening around these foods too. To say, okay, I'm constantly reaching for such and such when I'm feeling stressed. Yeah. Can I let that still be the case Mm -hmm. and also build some other tools for my stress management and see what happens with the different foods I'm craving and if that alters it or if it doesn't. and. If I come back to center around more attuned eating, yeah, more variety. Right. Something that I don't think we've said yet is just that because we have a pancreas that creates insulin, which then helps process glucose in the bloodstream for our body, there is a mechanism to process sugars. Not only do we need it, but we also have a mechanism to process it. And I think it's important to just hear that and to rest into that and trust that. And yes, if you have regular checkups with your doctor or you have, then that would be when you could find out if there was some breakdown of that process in your body. And of course, there are people that have insulin resistance and there are people that end up developing diabetes. And the development of that is for so many reasons. And I strongly believe that it is not because of sugar intake. And so, everybody to kind of have a trust in the fact that I can eat and let my body do what it knows what to do. And in the midst of this, do the work around understanding my relationship with food. And I think it's going to work out. And if you end up having diabetes, to then not have shame and anger towards oneself about that, because there's so many factors that are out of one's control when developing a disease like diabetes. And food intake is in my opinion, questionably one of them. But there are so many other factors. There is so much to learn about sugar. And this has been such a wonderful conversation to have with Julie about all the different dynamics and how we think about consuming sugar, why we need it, why it's actually not so toxic. But if you have any more questions, we'd love to hear from you. So you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, send us a question, and we'd love to talk a little bit more about it. If you want to learn more about Opal more generally, please go to opalfoodandbody.com to learn more about our programming. And yeah, follow us. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Love to be more connected. Thank you so much to Jack Straw Cultural Center for sound engineering, to Aaron Davidson for the Appetites original music, and to Hans Anderson for editing. Tune in next time. Bye. <laughs>